uh, welcome everybody to this uh, online event that we have. This is uh, Human Rights Watch talking about the reaction of the Russian authorities to the COVID pandemic. And we have been looking at this on a, from a number of different angles and our experts have really been extremely prolific in the, the last few weeks and months, um, just publishing on dozens of different issues from privacy to surveillance to, um, to different regulations that are coming into force. And um, we're lucky to, to have with us uh, today um, three of my colleagues, Daniela Aitkhojina and Rachel Denver and Tanya Lokshina, all from different locations, of course, um, in the age of COVID, this is the way we do things. And for everyone who's watching, you can send us questions uh, and I am able to look at those questions in the chat. So um, we're trying to get the Facebook set up and I know that some people are uh, looking at that and trying to sort it out. So we will keep going uh, on that. But if you are able to, um, if you are able to, uh, if you're able to see us on the other link, there was a second link that was uh, published there, which is the, um, uh, uh, sorry, the blue jeans link. And I do see we have some attendees who have joined us and you are welcome to post your comments and questions there and then we can take them up. I think um, because we have so many different topics to go through today, I wanted to kind of um, move as quickly as we possibly can. Um, as I say, we're gonna be run through uh, a lot of things, uh, a lot of different issues. And I wanted to start with some of the surveillance and privacy issues that have been, uh, that have been troubling us uh, and other human rights organizations over the, over the past weeks and months. Um, first of all, these surveillance and, and the systems, there's been a couple actually that we need to talk about. One first, I wanted to go to you, Rachel, and talk about this, um, what is it called? Smart city, this facial recognition system. Now this was, this already existed kind of before or it was in plan and now they've kind of accelerated it. And it's one of the most extensive mass surveillance systems in the world now, is that correct? Well, that's right. So Moscow for, uh, for months now has been developing something called Smart City. It would, when it's fully, uh, when it's fully developed, uh, it will be uh, the world's it aim, it aspires to be the world's largest um, widest collection of uh, surveillance cameras equipped with face recognition technology. So uh, that system has been in operation for a while now. It was used during last summer's, pro uh, you know, to, to catch people who had been involved in last summer's protests. Uh, it is, and it's being used to, uh, to ensure that people who are supposed to either um, uh, self-isolate because they re returned from abroad or who are being, um, you know, mandated or home quarantine. So if they break their, if you break isolation, if you break quarantine uh, and you're out in the streets, you, one of these many cameras that's either in your courtyard or in the metro system or out on the street or wherever will, you know, can, could track you down. That's only, that's only one piece of, of the, uh, that's only one piece of the picture though. Um, would you like me to go through the other pieces? Um, sure. Yeah, I, I just but with that with that recognition, the the police chief uh, claimed that like already a few hundred people had been sort of caught right. breaking their surveillance. Well, uh, that was I mean that was uh, early. Uh, yeah, early. Actually, early on, like even as early as uh, I think you know uh, late March or early April, the police chief had already boasted that they'd caught two hundred people who had violated their their the their their. their mandated self-isolation, I imagine that the numbers are much higher uh, now. Um, and now, uh, the, face rec the face recognition face recognition technology that uh, that these, um, that the cameras are equipped with, um, uh, you know, it can also, uh, you know, catch, I think it's important to understand how it is that people are being monitored, monitored in a way that they could be caught by the face recognition technology. So people who have COVID uh, who have COVID-19 who tested positive for coronavirus and who are being treated at home, um, mandated for treatment at home rather than the hospital, they are given, uh, uh, they have to have a social monitoring app installed on their, on their cell phone, on their device. Um, and that, right. so, that so app, how does that, how does that work? Uh, so you register, uh, you provide your, uh, you provide your passport information, you provide a photo uh, and you provide other data. 
um, and that you have to you have to allow the, the the app to access all you know a wide variety of settings, including obviously your geolocation data. Uh, you have to allow it to access um, your uh, you know your internet, your calls, your uh, anything that can can locate you, and anything that can that can detect whether you have are actually turning on or turning off the uh, your cell phone. So you can't you can't escape it by like turning off your cell phone. If they if uh, the registration authorities figure out that you've turned off your cell phone, they're going to come and you know they they can come and uh, bang on your door and say what's going on with your cell phone. And if you violate the if you violate the regime, you know then you're subject to a you know variety of penalties. So it's in a way it's kind of like the electronic tagging that that you know exists in in other countries. I know you know for for you know criminals who are or or accused criminals who are on probation and supposed to stay in a a location or kind of like you know, they have already been charged with a crime usually uh, and they're out of jail but they have to stay in a certain space a certain area um, with an electronic tag on them. It sounds it sounds a little bit like that, is it? Yeah, it, it is very much like an electronic tag system. Also, um, there are, uh, it's, it, this has been implemented uh, in, uh, in, in Moscow for sure, but also in, uh, I think, a number of other regions by now. Um, so, um, in some places, the tagging, uh, the being, being caught happens automatically. So, if you um, if you are out on the streets and the and a camera catches you, it will catch you and fine you without your even knowing about it. Or it can catch you and fine you without your even knowing about it. So if you have, uh, there are cases that that we've that, that have already been published already where people, you know, someone um, uh, had traveled from Tomsk to Sakhalin and um, they uh, they were caught automatically on the they were caught in the camera. I don't think they realized they were caught in the camera. Um, and they were, they were, they, they found out that they were caught on camera and they were issued with a fine. And it turned out it to, to be a case of mistaken identity. So this, this wasn't a person right. who yeah. had been uh, quarantined. So yes, it is yeah, very much like an electronic yeah. tagging system. And, and you know, it, it, you can understand why the authorities would want to keep track of people who, uh, you know, who were, who were quarantined. You can understand why authorities would want to make people who need to be quarantined stay quarantined. But, um, but this is uh, this is a pretty intrusive. This is a quite an intrusive system, and it's got a lot of risks uh, in it. And one risk is that it's so intrusive that people who uh, who it could drive people to uh, avoid being tested, to avoid having anything to do with the health system in general, because they don't you know they don't want to be treated like a criminal. So uh, then you have people you know avoiding getting medical treatment. You have people and people avoiding um, having their you know their, their status being known to the authorities, and that's not that's not good either. So it's it's a big it, to me. It, it's it's a big overreach, and also it's got. I mean, there are other there are other risks as well. So uh, there's risk of data data breaches, and there already have been there have been a, a a lot of data breaches all over all over the country. There have been data breaches where people's COVID nineteen status has been leaked onto uh, social media. They're um, in a variety of locations from, uh, you know, really basically almost in, in, in many different regions of Russia, north, south, east, west. Um, there also have been, and, and when their status becomes known in their, in their communities, whether it's a small village or their neighborhood in a big city, then they're harassed by, they're, they're basically subjected like a, this mob mentality where um, they're harassed by, uh, they're harassed. They're threatened. They have neighbors checking in to make sure that, that they don't break quarantine. It's 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 quite creepy. Um, and um, there are also uh, maps that have been uh, that have been circulated on social media. Maps uh, showing the the allegedly the locations of people who have uh, who are who have tested positive for coronavirus. Showing them, you know, showing like these neighborhood maps where they might be, which is also uh, you know. A big breach of privacy and uh, and, uh, and a big problem. So um, yeah, we had we had a question actually from from one of the people watching right now who's who's uh, uh, they ask um, who's providing the technology? I mean, is it just is it from a, a Russian company or is it is it uh, uh, foreign technology that comes in? Uh, somebody's helping them. I mean, do we know? I mean, where's the, where's the technology from? 
Uh, the security app uh, is actually a Russian app. Uh, it was specifically developed for those purposes. And in case an individual who needs to get the app, and it is mandatory, but it is mandatory only for COVID patients, not for those who are in contact with the COVID patients, but rather for the patients themselves who are not treated in a hospital, but who are rather staying at home because their condition is not that severe. So if an individual is sick and is staying home, and the COVID diagnosis was confirmed, and that individual does not have a smartphone, then the authorities would actually issue a smartphone with the app to the individual. And one of the uh, features of the app, and it just takes me back to what Rachel said about how well people find it excessive and intrusive, and how in many cases people would prefer not to seek medical treatment so that they wouldn't get diagnosed. So one of the things that the app actually does is that in order to make sure you don't leave it behind and step out for a second, it actually sends you messages at random time intervals, and then you have to answer those messages. And if you don't, then the authorities assume that you just left your phone behind and you broke the quarantine. So if you think about someone who is sick, they have the virus, and yes, the symptoms are not severe enough for that individual to be hospitalized, but that person is not feeling well at all, running a fever and possibly sleeping. And then there is the app that sends you messages several times during the day. And if you are asleep, and you don't answer one of the messages, then you're supposedly in violation. So that's also one of the features that sort of discourages people from, well, disclosing their health issues. But I think if you allow me, Andreas, I already have explored that it would be good for our audience just to get an idea where Russia stands on the COVID front. So Russia is very hard hit, one of the hardest hit countries. At this point, um, to date, over 93,000 Russia's residents have been diagnosed with COVID-19, and over 850 people died. Moscow, with its population of over 12 million people, is predictably the epicenter of this epidemic, with over 48,000 people diagnosed with COVID, and 546 people dead to date. So the government, of course, introduced all sorts of different measures, but there are two things that need to be taken into account. First of all, in Russia, no emergency situation has been declared. And the reason no emergency situation was declared is possibly that the federal government did not want to take on the financial responsibility, among other things. So, if there is an emergency situation, then under Russian law, those individuals who lost property, whatever possessions, suffered harm during to uh, due to the emergency measures, they have the right to claim a reimbursement, a compensation from the state. But if, say, your business is shut down, and you're suffering terrible financial damages, but there is no emergency situation, then you are not entitled to seek damages. So that's possibly one of the key reasons why the federal government decided not to go for invoking the emergency law. Now, without the emergency law, what Russia's invoked is so-called high alert regime, which has no proper legal definition, so it's neither here nor there. And secondly, which is very important, mm -hmm. the burden of responsibility was actually put by the Kremlin on the governors. So the governors are the ones who have to decide which particular measures to introduce to contain the spread of the virus in their respective regions. And the governments are also the ones who have to uh, struggle financially. So whatever benefits local residents are getting in light of the COVID situation, they come from regional budgets. And that's also something very important to take into account, especially as you all know that in uh, uh, over the past, well, more than a decade, really, Russia has been building and building up this federal power vertical. 
and everything was supposedly being decided by the federal center and controlled by the federal center. So now, suddenly, in this crisis situation, instead of taking control and being in charge of all the key decision making, the Kremlin says, well, the governors should decide. The regions yeah. should decide. Right. It, it reminds me a little bit. Of, it reminds me a little bit of the the United States and what you see the the, the battle between the, the the White House and the governors of individual states, sort of arguing about you know who's in yes, charge precisely, who's, uh, precisely. Yeah. But I would say that that is fairly typical for the United States, but it is very far from typical in contemporary Russia, where the Kremlin has been very strongly asserting its decision making power and its control. Mm. So it's a particular situation that the country finds itself in and the consequences are going to be very far reaching. Now the borders were shut down indefinitely except for those Russians who are returning to the country and the only way for them to return to the country is to get on those evacuation flights. But the evacuation flights are very scarce and very dramatic and actually I'm one of the stranded Russians and currently in Southeastern Asia and I have no idea when exactly I would be able to return to Moscow and I've been stranded for weeks now. Uh, by March 19, the high alert regime, which I mentioned, was introduced in all the regions of the country. Mass gatherings were cancelled, schools and universities and kindergartens got shut down. And on March 25th, President Putin announced what he called, in a very peculiar manner, a non-working week. So he didn't say quarantine, he did not say self-isolation, he didn't say anything unpleasant. He rather said something which was reminiscent of a holiday of sorts. He basically said, well, you know, I'm announcing this non-working week, so for the next seven days, you know, you'll just be crazy and stay home or go to the dacha, dacha meaning like cottages in the country that many Russians have, and just take things easy. And many people, in fact, took it for like, a holiday, a new public holiday. And so there was lots of barbecuing and lots of festivities basically happening with people having all that free time on people their hands. <laughs> yeah, uh, they did, many of them just did not understand the drama. They did not understand the seriousness of the situation. So here is the president saying, well, we are giving you a holiday. And yeah, it's good for the president's ratings, supposedly. But then at the same time, mm, have contributed, as far as medical experts are saying, to the uh, spread of the virus. That seven-day non-working whatever got extended and then extended again. And so at this point, it's going to last through the 11th of May. And then we shall see. That Next is not clear, but Putin indicated that self-isolation regime in particular would be gradually lifted in stages after the 11th of May. It's going to be open first. We don't know how slow this process is going to be. We also don't know. So in different regions, there are different measures. I have already yeah. spoke about some of the measures in Moscow. Similar measures are seen in other Russian regions, including QR codes, and of course, the most extreme case is yeah, can Chechnya. Yeah, I, I just ask, Tanya, could I just, could I just ask a little bit more about mm -hmm. that, that QR code? Because I think, you know, a few weeks ago, everyone was stunned at the, the images uh, coming from Moscow with, you know, people trying to get on public transport, and um, it was an enormous amount of confusion. But people had to register and get a, a QR code, so, you know, a, a, a scannable code that then they could uh, get on public transportation. What, what, what happened with the rollout of that? What, was that? what was that all about? Right, so the way it works is that you have to go online on a governmental website, on uh, the city website, for that matter. You have... Oh, Tanya froze. Uh-oh. Yeah, I think we froze, uh, Tanya. Yeah, I, I can explain in the meantime how the system works. Oh, so basically, oh, okay. uh, you yeah, have Daniela, please. <laughs> several, yeah, you, you have several options. You can go um, online on the Moscow government website. You can uh, send a text message or you can call the hotline and provide the details like your passport information, the purpose uh, of your 
visitation, so to say, to the city, etc. And you will uh, get um, a code which is digital and numerical. Oh, sorry, um, there are numbers and uh, letters in it. Uh, and essentially, uh, at the initial stages, um, you, you got this code, but as the system uh, was progressing, now in order to uh, order a taxi or to enter public transportation, you uh, have to provide this system. And with the public transportation, uh, there is a, uh, a card, like an Oyster card in um, London or Metro card in New York, and now it's uh, your code needs to be linked to that card, otherwise the card would not work. Um, so you're prevented from accessing uh, public transportation unless you have this code. The same works with the taxi. The taxi drivers are obliged to check uh, mm. you having that code in order to for you to use the service. Um, it's uh, on the streets. Uh, it's basically random checks. If you get caught without uh, having this uh, pass, you will be fine. Well, Chuck, can I ask? This is only meant uh, for public transportation. Nothing, technically speaking, should be preventing you from walking the streets. But then, of course, it all depends on how different police officers handle different situations. But yes, if you walk around your neighborhood, supposedly you should not get fined. And if you do, you can go to a court of law and you can appeal the fine. However, there are only two courts, as far as uh, some human rights lawyers told me, in the city of Moscow who take on those cases, and they're really in the outskirts of the city. So in order to appeal a fine, you have to travel to the under, uh, other end of this humongous city and uh, get yourself exposed, of course, to being on public transportation for a long time and so on and so forth. So it is in itself rather problematic. Yeah. Uh, so if I may add, there is another problem with the uh, residence addresses is because you're only allowed to walk on the streets without this pass if you're within the 100 meters of your place of residence or if you're going to the nearby grocery shop or pharmacy. And the way you have to prove that uh, you're near your place of residence is basically uh, is this proof of residence, which a lot of people actually have a different registration address from where they actually factually live. And some people run into problem with that, being outside their houses, but actually having a stamp with a different address in their passports, and that's how they end up uh, having the fines. Hmm. Can, can, I, uh, can I ask with this, I mean, how worried are you? I mean, I don't know, maybe Rachel, if you want to pick it up, or, or Damiela, Tanya, how worried are you that some of these measures that maybe seem you know justifiable to some extent or that at least people are a little bit more willing to put up with in a pandemic situation you know don't disappear or you know aren't relaxed or eased um you know after the pandemic passes i mean that's how how worried are you about that i think that's the main but well two things first i don't yes this is a it's a pandemic it's serious the state needs to act um, it didn't necessarily have to act in this way in order to get social compliance with self-isolation, with social distancing and the like. This was a choice that it made. Um, many countries don't uh, have permis permission-seeking regimes to leave the house like we have in Moscow. So it, it, was, it, was a conscientious, it was a conscious choice. It didn't have to be that way. Um, uh, and... I think that it is very risky. I think that there is a, uh, I think that that is the, the number one question is nothing, you know, nothing sticks like the temporary. The template now is there. The template now for social control via apps. The template now for permission seeking regimes to leave, to leave the house. The technology is set up. The systems are set up. It can, it is, it, it's a template that can be referred to um, in, in, other, in some other circumstances, somewhere down the road, where the, where the authorities might decide that they're in a situation where they need to exert social control, right? So if there are a lot of protests, for example, if there is some uh, political instability where these kinds of measures, um, if, they're, if, they're on, if their justification is kind of questionable right now in a situation of pandemic, um, then their justification in a situation where 
there, uh, there's political instability because of social unrest and social discontent, uh, that justification would be even weaker. So I think that is the, that is the number one question you're asking now. But I also, do, I'd, I'd love to hear from, uh, from others as well. Yeah, the temptation will be there for, for them to say. Go on, Tanya, sorry. Yeah, even if you bracket the technology, which is definitely ready and prepared now and would be used in the future, as many experts have pointed out, the pandemic is going to go away at some point, but the surveillance technology and all those new control measures, they are going to stay with Russia for a long time. But even if you bracket the technology, like I said, there are certain provisions uh, which were invoked right now that may not get lifted. They, uh, there is a ban on public gathering, right? And yes, at some point the pandemic is going to go away, but it's not going to go away very soon. So nothing, technically speaking, prevents the Russian authorities from having public gatherings banned for the next half a year, maybe even longer than that, citing possible epidemiological threats. Likewise, uh, those uh, tracking uh, measures, uh, pro-governmental media in particular, uh, identified foreigners and people coming from foreign countries as a major threat from the viewpoint of uh, COVID threats in Russia. And that on the one hand, like Rachel pointed out, led to lots of very frightening incidents of uh, people being harassed, people getting hate messages, people being even physically attacked, simply because they traveled to a foreign country and then supposedly returned and supposedly brought the virus into Russia. And I'm talking specifically, among others, about people who were not even infected with the virus, but who simply returned from abroad, right? So the government, for example, may be tracking the foreigners and those who return to Russia from foreign countries using those same technologies for much longer than the epidemiological necessity actually dictates. Mm -hmm. So these are the well, things that we're we are... On that subject, sorry, let me, just, let me just... Yeah, while we're on just that, that, that particular issue of... of dealing uh, or how, how the state is dealing with foreigners in the country specifically. I mean, there's a number of like migrant related issues. Um, Daniela, I don't know if you want to, to take this up, just how thousands are stuck in uh, migration detention. Uh, and, and some, I understand there's been some change in the status of some people or some, an extension allowed for some people, but there are still lots of people stuck in migration detention. Is that correct? Yes, um, yes. So the thing is, there are um, over 70 uh, migration detention centers across Russia, um, and people get uh, there um, under different circumstances. There are foreigners who committed a crime in Russia, and after they have served their sentence, they uh, pretty much automatically are then um, ordered for deportation. And until the deportation is enforced, they are placed in these migration detention centers. But apart, apart from that, there is a large group of uh, foreigners, uh, primarily labor migrants, who get in these detention centers because of some irregularities in their uh, documents. And um, majority of them come from the former Soviet uh, Union countries, uh, primarily Central Asia, uh, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan. Um, and they don't need visa to enter Russia, but then regularizing their status or maintaining all of the quite complex uh, number of documents that they have to maintain, including the uh, residence registration, which landlords are highly reluctant to provide to their residents, is highly problematic. And then if people are caught, and police actually racially profile these people and target them specifically, um, sometimes uh, for extortion, sometimes basically because they need to fulfill a certain number of cases, uh, then they end up in these detention centers. And if there are some problems with their documentation, let alone if they are actually effectively stateless or undocumented, then they can uh, stuck in this protracted situation, uh, in some cases for over two years. 
legally two years uh, is a legal limit for people to um, remain in this situation. But in practice, there are cases where people actually um, fall through the cracks in the system and um, eventually um, end up in indefinite detention. And now with the lockdown, uh, essentially all of the country lockdown with the borders being closed since end of March, people are effectively in this situation for undetermined period of time. And uh, coronavirus has actually put a spotlight on all of the problems that pre-existing problems with these migration detention centers because they are not designed for people to stay there for a long period of time. Uh, probably the original rationale was that people would be placed there temporarily and then um, expediently removed. But that's not what is happening um, in practice. And um, all of the problems that existed there, including uh, poor sanitation, uh, overcrowding, and lack of access to our medical um, assistance and basic health care are now aggravated. And because people are essentially on a lockdown there, uh, unfortunately, they may become a perfect breeding ground for the virus. Um, yeah, those if, are all the uh, conditions the for helping to there. spread the virus, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, there are um, reports of... I just, in, mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, there are some cases where it seems that the, the countries of origin are taking effort to provide for um, opportunities to get their people out. For instance, on um, April 12th, uh, Uzbekistan uh, operated the flight to take um, around 200 of its nationals out of detention center in Moscow. And uh, that is a very good example of actually states cooperating to try and resolve the situation. But apart from that, there is not enough effort on either side to resolve the situation. And Russia at the policy level is not looking into solution of this situation as of yet, although it did um, alleviate the situation of the remaining stranded migrants, at least in terms of the documentation. So um, in mid-March and now recently, there were two pieces of legislation that basically, yes, granted extension, temporary extension for the uh, until the latest the 15th of June to a wide range of um, documentation and also allowing employers to hire these migrants with even if they are lacking uh, the work permits. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm just, thank you very much, Danielle. I'm just very aware of the time now. We've We've been going for about uh, 35, uh, 40 minutes, and I just there's a couple of really key issues I wanted to get to. Uh, I don't think we're going to get to absolutely everything, but there's one um, issue that we I think really have to talk about uh, in particular, or at least one maybe, uh, and that's the state within a state uh, known as Chechnya and what's been happening there. The, the the harshest of the harshest places that exists, kind of with the support of the Russian state, but sort of somehow outside of it almost. Um, and Tanya, could you please walk us through what's been happening there? Because it's been, you know, the things that I've read uh, in the notes that you sent me are just, just, a, just appalling. And now we're locked up. Hold on. Tanya, you're muted. Tanya, you need to sorry, unmute, Tanya. sorry. Tanya. Ah, there we go. Okay, so sorry, Tanya, take it away. I'm Chechnya. Thank you. Yes, apologies. Uh, to start the conversation about Chechnya, I would want to repeat what Demere has just pointed out because it's extremely important. The COVID crisis has really shed the spotlight on whatever most aggravating problems with human rights that have been in place in Russia for a long time. And Chechnya effectively operates as a state within a state where international human rights law does not work, where Russia's own constitution and Russian legislation do not work. And the only law in Chechnya, as many people know, is whatever Mr. Kadyrov, the head of the Chechen Republic, orders. So, in this particular case, with the epidemic spreading to Chechnya, Mr. Kadyrov shut down the borders. 
And here I have to say Russia's Prime Minister, Mr. Mishustin, actually made an intervention and he uh, said publicly that new Russian governors are allowed to make those decisions, that those decisions are a privilege of federal authorities, to which Kadyrov responded that he did not really shut down the borders fully, that uh, uh, transportation with uh, commercial goods and whatever could still go in and out, but he was simply trying to protect Chechnya residents from uh, uh, newcomers who would contribute to spreading the virus. And that's where this whole issue sort of died. Now, Chechnya has been a closed region for a long time now. And those journalists and human rights defenders who took travel there at least were able to get some information about what's happening in Chechnya. Kadyrov wanted them out for a long time. Now with uh, the coronavirus pandemic, he actually got what he wanted. Chechnya is closed and new enemies of Kadyrov new critics of Kadira from the outside can access the region physically. Whatever information we now have from Chechnya comes from uh, uh, messaging services and uh, uh, whatever conversations that we are able to have with residents of Chechnya who are extremely frightened and who are in uh, a prison of sorts. Because what can be described as a self-isolation regime in, say, the city of Moscow in Chechnya is rather about police and security officials beating people in the streets for, and I'm just giving you one example, being outside without a mask in a situation when masks are actually difficult to get. Also, COVID patients and their families are stigmatized to the point that people in Chechnya, as a prominent Russian journalist has put it recently, at times prefer to die at home and not seek medical assistance because they're just afraid of what the information about their positive status would do to their entire family sort of repercussions may follow. And as I mentioned that journalist, her name is Yelena Milashina, and she actually received HR double, uh, Human Rights Watch's Award for Extraordinary Activism uh, a few years ago. She's a brilliant journalist uh, from Novaya Gazeta, one of the leading Russian independent newspapers. She published this big piece about abuses perpetrated by Chechen authorities in uh, as part of their efforts to suppress the spread of COVID-19. And uh, when the article came out, Ramzan Kadyrov made a video statement threatening Milashina and Novaya Gazeta directly. And what he said in particular was that, uh, well, he called on federal authorities to quote unquote, Stop these non-humans and effectively threatened uh, federal authorities with uh, doing something about it unless they act. So Mr. Kadyrov said, you stop them or I will. You stop them or we will. And what happened in response uh, is also noteworthy. First of all, very promptly, the Prosecutor General's Office instructed uh, the uh, State Media and Communications Monitoring Agency to block the article by Milashina, uh, saying that the information in the article was not reliable, but providing no detail whatsoever as to which particular uh, points Milashina made uh, were untrue. Secondly, uh, one question. Uh, by journalists at one of his regular press briefings, uh, the Kremlin spokesperson, Dmitry Peskov, said that the Kremlin did not see anything out of the ordinary in the statement made by Kadyrov. 
stuff that the statement was emotional, but then Pascal basically shrugged it off saying this whole situation is very difficult and we are all being very emotional, so it's not surprising. And here I have to say that on the one hand, of course, the reaction of the Kremlin is completely unacceptable and very dangerous. On the other hand, ironically, Mr. Peskov actually told the truth. Ramzan Kadyrov, the head of Chechnya, has been making public threats to Nova Yagazeta and to Milosina in particular for a long time. High-level Chechen officials have been after Novaya Gazeta and Milashina since they exposed the vicious anti-gay purge which took place in Chechnya back in 2017. Numerous threats have been voiced by Kudirov and his henchmen, and there has been no reaction by the Kremlin whatsoever. And there has been zero effective investigation into those threats. So, yes, when the Kremlin spokesperson says, mm, you know, so Mr. Kudirov threatened Novaya Gazeta and Yelena Milashina, but that's nothing out of the ordinary. Indeed, that is nothing out of the ordinary. Even it's though it's completely. Isn't it? I mean, the, the, it's just, it's an absolutely incredible situation that, that this, these kinds of threats can happen and they're open and the government admits them and that's it. It sort of ends there. And that's can, it. And the government I, can admits I just, can I move, the government describes them as ordinary. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, as ordinary. Yeah. So this is, this is acceptable. I just wanted to kind of move on and, and maybe I, I don't, uh, we have very little time left now because um, Danielle, I just wanted to, to bring you in again because we were talking about, um, uh, since we're talking about, um, information and one of the things we've seen in other places around the world is nothing to the extent i think uh, maybe uh, of what tanya just described in chechnya but an effort by some governments that to control information and to really try to you know crack down on anyone who is providing uh, any information in fact that's arguably one of the reasons why why the world is in this situation in the first place because you know china censored a doctor who tried to explain that there was a new virus uh, at the end of December, uh, and rather than listen to his warnings, they censored him and uh, cracked down on him. He later died in February, um, as you might know. But as we look at this, like the, the attacks on so-called fake news or attacks by authorities on you know, basically information that they don't like, um, how has that played out in, in, in Russia? Uh, yes, so it is uh, one of those uh, examples, uh, coming back to the earlier discussion, of changes that being introduced against the background of coronavirus pandemic that is likely to stay um, afterwards because um, a piece of legislation has been enacted, signed by uh, President Putin uh, at the very end of March, uh, came into effect um, at the beginning of April, that uh, criminalized uh, fake news um, in the context of, context of um, pandemics, uh, um, human-made or natural disasters in a wide range of uh, basically uh, situations where uh, providing um, information that is considered by the authorities as to amount to fake news um, can be right. uh, liable as administrative penalty or actually a criminal offense uh, up to three years um, um, in detention. And if it leads to our fatality, then up to five years in detention, uh, which is highly problematic. So up to five years uh, and, and, and exactly, I mean, you hit on exactly the problem, which is that who defines what is so-called fake news? And it's the authorities in every case, right? Exactly. Um, it's probably worth mentioning that uh, the authorities started basically going after uh, on this path already last year because they enacted the first piece of legislation specifically on the fake, fake news um, last year. But this year, it's basically considered they expanded it. And the problem is, in, uh, the Russian authorities have been criticized for that in the past, is because the legislation is vague and uh, lacks. Uh, basically legal certainty to uh, for people to be able to say 
that if I do this, this is what I'm going to face. In this case, you don't really know what will be considered um, as fake news. And apart from, uh, and there are already um, several dozen of cases related to administrative penalties for uh, fake news, and there are already several uh, criminal cases, um, basically where people are charged uh, as a criminal offense in relation um, to our, what is considered to be fake news uh, in relation to coronavirus. And one of the particularly disturbing examples is a criminal case where so far a journalist is, uh, has a status of a witness, not accused in the criminal case, but the practice shows that the status can uh, quickly flip and she can become accused. And that particular uh, episode relates to a journalist uh, reporting, reporting an anonymous um, doctor in St. Petersburg talking about the lack of preparedness um, um, to tackle a uh, COVID crisis there. Um, and unfortunately, um, apart from um, that, there are other mechanisms that the Russian authorities are employing to stifle free speech. For instance, there is a, a committee in the in Russian um, parliament, um, Gosduma, that basically has a committee uh, that is now looking into several uh, media outlets, including Radio, Radio Liberty, Deutsche Welle, uh, Medusa, a local uh, media, all in relation to what uh, you would consider a valid uh, journalistic reporting. Uh, um, and um, for instance, in Medusa and uh, Radio Liberty case, that was in relation to their reports where they were uh, alleging a lack of our land machines um, in Russia. In um, Deutsche Welle's case, it's absolutely, I mean, all of these cases are quite outrageous. And That's unfortunately, right. that is like another example of the Mokos um, sort that the Russian authorities have now to put the stifle free speech. And as I already said, when the pandemic will go, will uh, cease to exist, that legislation will remain. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Listen, we've been going on now for an hour, and I, I, you know, I think the the overall lesson here has been that all of the attacks and cons all, all the attacks on on fundamental rights and the concerns that we and other organizations have had about uh, the crackdown in uh, in Russia. All of these things that we've been seeing over the years have really kind of accelerated and deepened over the last few weeks and months. Um, Rachel, would you want to put a, a tie a bow around the the the, the whole thing and, and and summarize in a few sentences for us before we before we wrap it up what your what your maybe what your hope is is that if there if there's anything kind of positive to to look at what what would you hope to see. Um, you know, the come out come out in the next you know few months, and if there would be anything that you would see, kind of something positive uh, in the coming months. Wow, Andrew, that's a that's a tough one. It's a tough one. I, I always give you like... the tough one at the end. There you go. <laughs> I think I'd like to see. I, I think that we can hope to see more social solidarity and a rate and a hmm. heightened awareness, uh, social solidarity for. Uh, particularly for the um, medical personnel who are putting their lives in the line and uh, social solidarity for the journalists who are and other providers of information who are um, exposing the, cir the circumstances in which uh, the medical community is, is facing. I think, yeah, I think I would hope for more solidarity. I think I would hope for a big dose of public skepticism for these um, restrictive measures that the government is using in these in the circumstances that Tanya and Demelia uh, described. I think I would hope for a, a deep, you know, kind of a deep public skepticism about, uh, you know, the acceptability of these measures, um, uh, you know, to be applied in in circumstances where where they are not justified. So I, I would hope that that this. That the the experience with these restrictive measures in co in the context of COVID nineteen doesn't become uh, just something that people have gotten used to. I would hope that there is a great, mm. uh, an elevated sense of of of, of public 
uh, public awareness that, that this is it's not unusual, that it, it shouldn't become reflexive, it shouldn't become a habit, and it shouldn't become something that people get used to, and it shouldn't become something that, that people can just blithely, should blithely accept whenever the government does that, uh, that we need to have these additional measures. Hmm. Fair. Well, that is, I mean, that is positive to see a little, hopefully for a little pushback and in building on some social solidarity with some of the parts of society that are, uh, you know, under most strain. So we have been going I mean, an hour. I mean, to wrap uh, it up now. Oh, sorry. Oh, go on, honey. Oh, yeah. You have literally 30 seconds, though. Yes. Well, I just wanted to say that there are amazing examples of social solidarity in Russia now. I mean, you have hostels to let the homeless in because the government is not helping them out and there's people are in the streets. And so you have hostels who open their doors to the homeless. You have restaurants who feed the doctors and other medical professionals. You have people who support neighbors, all the neighbors in their apartment buildings by bringing them groceries and walking their dogs and doing all sorts of things that those people are not able to do for themselves. And if I had enough time, I would go on and on and on and on just for hours listing different examples of people stepping in and feeling the gaps where the government is not doing anything much and that they can actually make a difference. And I think that's gonna stay. And in fact, even the negative things like the new tracking app, well, what if it actually encourages Russia to use house arrest more often now that they see that it works? Russia is infamous for locking people up before trial. But now that the app is in place, possibly it's going to give the courts a motivation to put people under house arrest and send them into pre-trial detention centers. So there are lots of positive outcomes that could be, that you could get out of it. And let's just hope that the positive stays and the negative goes.